Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halleck. This week, the growing threat to our forest lands and millions of trees across the Adirondacks. You've probably seen these purple cardboard traps. They've been hung in trees across the North Country to try to catch emerald ash borers, a shiny green beetle that bores into ash trees, killing them by the millions across the Northeast U.S. and Canada. They've been found just north of the Adirondacks in Quebec, just across the International Bridge and St. Lawrence River from the Aquasasne Mohawk Reservation. And forestry scientists are also worried about another microscopic insect, damaging hemlock trees across New York. The hemlock woolly adelgid is the name of the invasive forest pest and the title of a documentary airing this weekend here on Mountain Lake PBS about the efforts to combat these invasive species that are threatening our forest. Hemlocks are a very important species ecologically. In the wintertime, a lot of animals need hemlock forests to survive heavy snowfalls. And indeed, in the summertime, you get the trout. They depend on the coolness of the hemlock forest, the shade of the hemlock forest, so that they can reproduce. It's not just living things that depend on the hemlocks. The physical habitat itself, the natural terrain in which they live, depends on them to survive. They're a species that grows on steep slopes and gorges. Their roots make sure that the soil stays put and the gorges don't erode too quickly. They create a really beautiful ecosystem, and without them there, it would be very different. Unknown to most, in the northeastern United States, a small white fuzz appears on hemlock branches. It is light and soft like wool and collects around the base of the needles. This is the hemlock woolly adelgid. These white tufts are the egg sacs. The insect itself is really a small reddish brown to black sort of blob almost with just six little legs and a feeding tube that looks almost like the silk on a corn. What you see when you look at a twig is the wool that it makes is that white fluffy stuff. You know, basically it's just this little tiny blob of protoplasm that's like a millimeter in diameter. It just puts its mouth parts into a twig and feeds on the tree. So you know, what could be complicated about that scenario? But in reality, the response of the trees, the physiology of the trees uh, with the insects is, is very complicated. We don't understand so much about this insect. All you need is one individual to settle on a tree and it can begin reproducing. So very quickly, those populations increase. They don't need to mess around. They just lay eggs, they hatch, and they get going. And there's two generations a year. So that's a lot of bugs in one year from one individual that settles on the tree. And that is the basis of the problem. With limited time and options available, forestry departments are turning to use pesticides to save the trees. There's definitely an environmental impact when you use chemicals but there's also a environmental impact of doing nothing. So if we don't do anything and we don't do this treatment on these trees, they will all eventually die. However, there may be a better option. Laracobius nigrinus, or little Larry as researchers call it, is a beetle native to Asia and the Pacific Northwest, which feeds on the hemlock woolly adelgid. It is the check that keeps the hemlock woolly adelgid in balance. Biologists refer to a natural predator such as this as a biocontrol. Our hope is that we can protect stands long enough that a, a classic biocontrol would be used to try and protect the stands. That's our, that's our best hope. And then we can cut back on doing these treatments. Over 100 feet up, research is currently being conducted to see if Little Larry could be a viable option. Right now, Becky is making her way up into the upper part of the canopy. We are climbing to sample the hemlock trees, see if our biocontrol, Laracobius nigrinus, is present. The predator beetle was previously released at this field site to see how successful it could be at controlling and reclaiming previously infested hemlock trees. Even though little Larry seems promising, 
researchers need to run tests in a controlled environment to make sure that introducing this insect won't do further damage. I think the future for the hemlock woolly adelgid in New York, I, th I think I think we really can control it. I think we have a chance. Some of the other invasive species that we're looking at, like emerald ash borer, that's a pretty grim scenario. We think we have a fighting chance to save hemlock throughout the state of New York. Right now, the best option is pesticide treatments to keep your hemlocks healthy and alive. And once the biocontrol is a larger population, we'll be able to distribute it and people will no longer have to use pesticides. I'm not going to sit by and just wait for hemlocks to disappear. You know, the old adage, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I think in a lot of instances, that's the way things play out with uh, forest pests. Uh, all of a sudden, the trees are dead, and uh, people wonder what the heck happened. And Jerry Carlson is with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Welcome. We appreciate you being here. What is the worry about what this pest is doing to well, the forest? Well, uh, unfortunately, most people don't even know how important hemlock trees are to us, but we have them literally statewide, and they occupy a vitally important role for the ecosystem in the forest. You know, they're the, they're the trees that supply the deep shade and the cool water for our trout-bearing streams. They, they're long-lived, so they provide aesthetics on the landscape for a long period of time. We have a long history of use of the hemlock trees as well. So we're very concerned about it getting into our forest preserve for us. The woolly adelgid was first detected in, in the Hudson Valley back in the 80s? Well, in the Hudson Valley, yeah, back in the 80s, but it's been on the continent for longer than that. In yeah. Virginia, way back right. in the 50s, right? right? Yes, exactly. So a slow yeah. progression north. Is that, is that now speeding up? Are we seeing the progression? Well, you know, there are controversial studies that uh, have the yin and the yang of that. But definitely it's moving at about 25 to 40 kilometers a year mm -hmm. and, um, and some places faster. And I th we think that the main mechanism of dispersal is with the migratory birds. And the birds just love those hemlock trees along the riparian, along the waterways. They jump up and down from the lower branches to the water. And uh, they carry the adelgid probably on their bodies during the migratory phase. And that also coincides with uh, a, a, a sort of a rare period in the adelgid life cycle where it's actually uh, not attached to the tree. So it can jump on a bird's foot or a bird's foot can collect it and then away it goes. So how far has it spread up into New York State and how close is it getting to the Adirondack Park? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's north in Albany County and uh, we regularly survey for it all the time and uh, I hope that that's as far north as it is, but it's a difficult insect to see when it's early. We had a scare a couple of weeks ago where we had someone that knows what the adelgid looks like was hiking uh, in the speculator area and uh, um, they said that they thought they had seen the woolly adelgid, so we sent crews in there right away. We have not been able to confirm it, which is, we weren't able to see what they saw that they suspected, so it's difficult. It's a very tiny, tiny insect, and uh, the oh, evidence must have been a, a relief, but is it one of those well, things you think it may <laughs> only be a matter of time? I don't, yes, we're pretty sure it's only a matter of time, so we're trying to uh, get all of the groups that are concerned to be aware that this is coming and we need to be prepared. We need to know what the best operating practices are in terms of survey detection and perhaps even mitigation and treatment. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it is a very tiny insect. Uh, yeah. the, the most visible sign of its presence is the, the white fuzz that right. you'll spot on the hemlock tree. Yeah, so what that is, is uh, the uh, mature adult uh, basically fills its body cavity with eggs and then it dies and that's what's underneath that white fuzz is, uh, is just a, a, a blob of eggs, you know, one to three hundred depending on how large they were. And two populations a year, right? Yes, it has a very complicated life cycle. Basically, the, uh, the main population, if you will, is the overwintering one. It, uh, it, it, it's right now. Right now it's a crawler and it's established itself. Right now they're actually boring into the hemlock trees and they're starting to create the fuzz. And then they will, uh, they will um, uh, be there until next uh, spring, next March, and then 
big. They'll, they'll, they'll be eggs, bags of eggs by then. And you mentioned they bore in. How do they kill the tree? Yeah, that's very interesting. They, uh, they obviously uh, feed on it, so they, they feed on the, on the vital juices of the tree, but they also um, um, upset its immune system by feeding on it. And so the tree sort of starts to self-kill itself. Yeah. And you like a hyperimmune system action. And you mentioned mitigation. Huh. Yeah. Is there any way to tackle it now? Is there, are, do pesticides work? Yes. They do. We have, yes. We have um, some very sophisticated, with the help of uh, Mark Whitmore at Cornell, looking at what the best operating practice is to treat this thing. So we have basically a two-pronged approach to it. They're, they're trunk, basal trunk sprays, put them on once and the one compound actively kills the insects that are on there now and then the other one becomes part of the system of the tree and it slowly kills or it kills any adelgids that attack the tree for the next uh, I think four or five years. So can you control it that way or does it get to a point where if it spreads too well, far then you can't you, there isn't enough pesticide or you just can't treat it. Well, I don't think there's any one of us that would advocate continued long-term sustained use of an environmental toxin. So, um, but what we hope to do coincidentally is to uh, develop, which we are actively pursuing, is to bring the natural beetle predators into the state along with it and release them in numbers. Uh, we're also with Cornell, Mark Whitmore at Cornell, we're, we're trying to establish um, insectaries. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find hemlock stands around the state or F preferably hemlock hedges and uh, that are infested with the woolly adelgid and then we will take over those and make sure that the woolly adelgid population does really really well to support the predator beetles that we will consequently raise on those hemlock trees. And we've heard so. about them, biocontrols where you Bio use yeah. uh, these beetles. How well is that working? Is it is it really uh, being well, viewed as a potential way to, to, to stop uh, the, the woolly adelgid? That's a really good question, Tom, and uh, lots of people are asking that. There are very few quantifiable um, reports in the peer-reviewed journals, scientific papers that, that, uh, that clearly show the benefit. So um, what we have more than anything else is the uh, western situation where you can go to the hemlock trees out there and find woolly adelgid on those hemlock trees and shake those trees and you get pockets full of the predators. The inference is that you know those trees don't get killed out there because they have this large complement of predators. And when you talk about using pesticides or biocontrols and you get into the Adirondack Park, then do you get into the whole issue where you're talking forest preserve and such? That oh, absolutely. It's not as simple as saying, let's go in yeah. and, and treat these trees with the with these, uh, you know, with these beetles, with these pesticides, uh, it becomes complicated. It's a big deal. Uh, we have made, started making presentations to the Forest Preserve Advisory Council or committee, and um, they are a group, uh, a group of people who are established to advise the DEC on management actions, and uh, we've been trying to, well, we have gotten them very aware of it, and they've taken initiative on their own. Now, uh, I think probably because of the hemlock woolly adelgid, but not the emerald ash borer as well, and the Asian longhorn beetle. Those are yep. significant threats that would uh, would threaten that whole forest preserve concept. There has been precedent for chemical controls inside the forest preserve, and the numbers that they talk about are substantial. You know, like they use that word substantial. Yeah. So what is that? Is that like 100 trees or is that 1,000 trees or is that 10 trees? That's another reason why I really would like to find it small. So yeah. that's why timeliness is key here to, to get the word out now that this is coming down right. the road. Right, and if we can find it when it's one or two trees, I don't think anyone's going to uh, have a problem with us treating it. You talk about some of the other forest pests, the emerald ash borer we've heard about uh, in the past problem few years. problem that's coming here. The thing with the emerald ash borer is that it gets moved by people in their firewood. Um, I hope none of that willingly or, or knowingly, but it's certainly it moves 25 to 40 miles a year uh, just by people not being aware that they're moving it around. With that's their, the biggest with their threat. Oh, yeah. It's already up on the northern border, up uh, to the north of us. In uh, Canada. In Canada and right across the St. Lawrence River, obviously concern 
On the New York State side, the mm -hmm. uh, St. Regis Mohawk Reservation, unlike the Woolly Adelgid, there's no biocontrol for the Emerald Ash Borer. Oh, no, absolutely, there is. There uh, is. Yes, we're, we're uh, releasing um, four species of parasite, parasitoids, um, that we've found, that have been found and cleared by the USDA uh, from China, Eurasia, and brought back mm. over here and released the uh, the wasp, their wasps, they lay their eggs inside the young emerald ash borer. And it's working well? I, I don't have as much optimism for that yet as I uh, do for the hemlock woolly adelgid predator release. Um, uh, but that's just because it's still in, very much in its infancy in terms of getting, and also, they're very, very difficult to raise, these wasps. Is there any hope that you may be able to stop the advance of these invasive species before they get to the North Country and Adirondack mm -hmm. Park? Or is it inevitable that they're going to reach well, here? Well, I don't think we will how not. how you respond to it. We will not be able to uh, stop the emerald ash borer from getting into the Adirondacks unless something which I'm totally unaware of occurs, which I don't think it is. We are trying to reduce the impact by making, instead of losing all the ash trees in the Adirondack, say in a 25 year period, maybe we can make it a 60 year period, which means, you, you know, ash trees only live 60 to 80 years. You could have this cycle of ash trees growing with the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer kills them and then some grow up, you know, and that would be the ideal ecological circumstance that we're searching for.